So, um, so as Jessica mentioned, uh, the topic of my presentation today is uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, an upcoming initiative that's being developed right now um, called the BC Marine Coastal Strategy, which might be um, one of the more significant provincial government initiatives on the coast in quite a while. Um, and it's something that West Coast environmental law has been advocating for quite a while and, and continues to be uh, very much involved in the development of. And um, my outline for today, um, I'm, I'm hoping uh, not to talk, I'm, I'm hoping to not take more than 20, 30 minutes of your time uh, because um, I wanna make sure that there's lots of time to answer any questions that you might have and, and I very much invite those. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about why we need a coastal marine strategy um, in British Columbia, uh, what this, what's missing and, and what this can do. And then I'm going to go into what this coastal strategy could achieve and could change uh, here in British Columbia. And then after that, I hope there will be lots of time to answer any questions that you might have. Um, okay, so um, to start about what, um, why we, why a coastal strategy is needed in British Columbia, um, I'm going to start by just talking uh, very briefly, but about an important topic that lawyers spend a lot of time thinking about, which is this complicated or long word uh, called jurisdiction. Um, which is really just uh, a lawyer legal word. Um, to say who has the power to make decisions about a certain subject under the law. And um, this is a topic that um, lawyers are very much concerned with. And in a country uh, like Canada, which was, uh, uh, you know, for example, it's founded on uh, the lands and waters of pre-existing indigenous uh, nations that, that have governments and their own laws. Um, and in a country that's a federal or a federation. So we have provincial governments in Canada and we have federal governments in Canada. Um, in that type of situation, um, I think it's not lost on anyone, but the idea of who has jurisdiction and uh, who makes decisions about certain things can often be very complicated uh, in Canada. And there's a whole body of law just on these topics. And um, that complication about jurisdiction is certainly the case as well when we talk about coastal um, or marine areas in Canada. And so um, what I've got right here is just a, a graphic. Uh, it's, it's quite a simplified graphic, but it just gives you an idea of different marine activities and shows that the different governments that are involved in making decisions about different marine activities. Um, so just to give you an example, you can see in the third uh, row here, you have uh, aquaculture. And so when you talk about aquaculture, um, this is something where, uh, you know, indigenous uh, nations probably have indigenous laws about where and how aquaculture should happen in their lands and territories. Um, and on top of that, you have um, constitutional rights. And then you have the federal government who's in charge of fish and so permits um, the activities of aquaculture. And then you might also have provincial governments who also have to give permits uh, because they're on lands that are served as provincial crown land. And on top of that, you might have local governments involved. And so you'll have a number of different decision makers who have some authority over these decisions. Um, but the one thing that's really missing um, and is a real concern in our ocean management is the coordination of all of those governments and all of those decision makers. Um, so, uh, and so this is leading to a lot of problems um, in our coastal management. Um, what we have um, is we have a lot of different uh, governments that are involved or not properly involved in decision-making and are not necessarily coordinated between each other. And we even have that within, for example, our provincial government. So our provincial government um, 
has several different ministries and departments who are in charge of making decisions on the coast. Uh, for example, the Ministry of the Environment, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, and the Ministry of uh, Forests and Rural Development. And all of these different actors aren't necessarily coordinated or, uh, or making decisions all together in concert. And that's leading to a lot of problems um, on our coast that we hear a lot when we talk to folks around the coast. So um, just to give you some examples, um, we often talk to folks who are very much worried about styrofoam and plastic pollution uh, in our waters. And uh, they approach governments. And for example, they'll approach the provincial government to address it and they'll be told, well, this is a federal issue. Um, or they'll talk to their local government and they'll say, we can't do anything about this. You know, this is a different order of government that's involved. Um, and that problem is especially concerning um, when we hear it also from indigenous nations, um, you know, who have constitutional uh, rights and title in these areas. So we, you know, we've talked to indigenous nations who are very much concerned about uh, shellfish aquaculture um, and, and getting edible uh, shellfish in their, uh, in their territories. And they're getting, you know, told to talk to this one order of government or to this other one, and they're not properly involved in those decisions. And so um, we have a lot of these problems on our coast right now that we sometimes refer to as cumulative effects problems, where a bunch of different decision makers are making decisions or permitting activities that are leading to these kinds of uh, problems that, that are affecting everyone with no one looking at the bigger picture. And this is exactly what um, a coastal strategy is meant to try to address. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, so before I get to that, um, so what I want to say is this, isn't, this is something that West Coast has been concerned about for a long time. And um, in 2019, uh, we uh, began a campaign uh, in coordination with uh, the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society to advocate for the need for a coastal strategy in British Columbia. And we started uh, this campaign uh, with a website and, and we've called this initiative the Blueprint for the Coast. And uh, for the last couple of years, we've been talking to a lot of decision makers and folks around uh, the province about the need uh, for this kind of strategy to coordinate our decision making. And we had a um, significant milestone achieved in our campaign in 2000 um, after the provincial election, when um, the, the newly elected provincial government under Premier Horgan committed to a coastal strategy in the mandate letters of its five, uh, of, five of its cabinet ministers. Um, and so you can see the commitment there uh, on your screen. Uh, the province is committed to developing a new provincial coastal marine strategy in partnership with First Nations and federal and local governments. Um, and a couple things that I want to say about this. Um, the first thing is, as you can see, this commitment made its way into five different cabinet minister letters. So you had cabinet ministers in the provincial, in the minister of environment, the minister of agriculture, and in what we call Flynn Road or the Ministry of Forests. Um, and it can really shows you how spread out already uh, coastal management decisions are within our government. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is that um, slightly disappointed that the government didn't go with our uh, term blueprint for the coast, but they decided to call this a coastal marine strategy. And I just want to point to the significance of that from what I understand from the provincial government is that they want this strategy to um, to be addressed and to change management of two areas in particular. So you had your coastal shoreline areas. And then the, the, the reason they added the word marine was to say, but we also want a strategy to be um, about dealing with more offshore areas as well. So they're referring to those as, as the marine part of the coastal marine strategy. So this was a big milestone for this campaign. It's something that has been talked about for a long time. And to finally get the government to commit to this um, was, was really uh, huge and, and, and very exciting uh, for us. 
And before I go on to the next part, which is I want to talk about what we can achieve and what we've seen uh, possible in other places in the world under a coastal strategy, I'm just going to give you a quick kind of overview of the timeline right now for this uh, process. Uh, none of this is, is written in stone, but this is what we understand is going to be happening. Um, so right now, um, in keeping with the government's commitment to co-creating the strategy uh, with Indigenous nations, uh, the province is reaching out and engaging with Indigenous nations on the coast. And what they are doing uh, this year and what their, their goal is, is to draft a kind of intentions paper of what this coastal strategy is going to look like. And it's quite exciting that the province is doing this um, in partnership with Indigenous nations, um, it, it, it's it's a great you know step forward uh, and, and a way of doing things. Um, when that uh, intentions paper um, is drafted, we understand that the next step would be to open that intentions paper up to broader public engagement. And uh, the idea is that we would have a coastal strategy and start implementing it. Um, in 2023 and, and perhaps in 2024 as well. And um, when I talk about implementation, what I kind of mean is the coastal strategy is going to be revamping how coastal management happens in BC. And so that's going to need, you know, not just probably uh, rearrangement of, of the decision makers who make these decisions, but also a law or perhaps different pieces of law to support that coastal strategy. And that's what I'm gonna talk about now is kind of the things that we can accomplish with this coastal strategy. So um, you may be surprised to know, well, well, first of all, I don't think you'll be surprised to know, but this idea that I've kind of presented to you that coastal management in BC is, is not very well coordinated and is spread out between a number of different governments. That's not something that's necessarily unique to British Columbia. There are a lot of other places around the world and in North America um, where there are different uh, governments that are involved in coastal management. And, um, and it's something that those places have been able to address. And how they've done it is through creating a coastal strategy. And so, um, I think a lot of people will be surprised to know, though, that BC is actually one of the only uh, places in uh, North America that hasn't actually developed a coastal strategy yet. Almost every uh, coastal state in the United States has already uh, done this. And for some of them, for example, Washington State, um, they've had coastal strategies in place uh, since the 1970s. So, you know, we're talking over 50 years um, at this point. Um, the, 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 the sunny side of that, though, is that as we develop our coastal strategy, we have amazing examples all around the world of things that we could emulate or learn from as we develop our own. And uh, you'll see on uh, this uh, slide that I have in front of you that, that we've got several examples from Canada and from the United States listed here, but we also have the Marine Planning Partnership which is a British Columbia initiative, uh, just at a smaller scale that I'm gonna talk about in a second, but it does uh, provide a real foundation for some of the stuff that could be accomplished in British Columbia. Okay, so, um, so just broadly speaking, the, the overarching goals of, of coastal strategies when you look at them around the world is to formulate common goals for coastal management and then to coordinate decision makers who are involved in that, that coastal management so that they're all working towards the same kinds of goals and making decisions that are furthering the same goals. And generally speaking, those goals are uh, having more holistic, sustainable ecosystem-based management so that you're not just looking at one particular activity or very localized places, but you're thinking about the health of the ecosystem, the sustainability of communities when you're making those decisions. And um, in British Columbia, um, although this isn't unique necessarily to British Columbia, but on top of that, we have a, a further goal 
um, that we will need to address as we build a coastal strategy, and that is implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about uh, the, this declaration, but I, I think the important things to know are that in 2019, BC enacted the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. And under this act, the province is required to make sure that um, all of its laws are consistent with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, the federal government has now also um, uh, adopted legislation requiring uh, the implementation of UNDRIP as well, as we call it. Um, and so here we have an opportunity um, with respect to ocean management to ensure that ocean management is going to be done in a way that's consistent with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I'm not going to go through um, in detail exactly what that would require or entail, but just at, at a high level, what that really requires is much better recognition, respect, and, um, and, and partnerships with Indigenous nations and, um, and their governments than we have right now. So um, I'm now going to talk about um, not just a few ways that, that, that we can get to better recognition and respect of, of, of Indigenous governments and our ocean management, but also just having better coordination of our ocean management in general through a couple of tools um, that have been adopted around the world and, and have been fairly successful. So um, the first one is um, a coastal commission. And so again, kind of, as I mentioned before, um, unlike say, for example, uh, the Ministry of Forests, we don't have a Ministry of Oceans or a, a provincial ministry that, that is really looking um, whose task is uh, how are we managing our, our oceans? And um, that's quite surprising because not only um, from an economic perspective are the oceans incredibly important uh, to the economy in British Columbia, uh, in fact, even more so than forestry, um, but they're also very, uh, you know, from a, a, a social perspective, from a cultural perspective, uh, Folks in British Columbia very much identify with the ocean and much of our lives are dependent on uh, the health of our ecosystems and on our activities that we carry out on the ocean. And so what we could do as has been done in uh, many other jurisdictions is we could adopt some kind of coastal commission who would be in charge of overseeing uh, coastal management in British Columbia. And, um, in, in keeping with our commitments to UNDRIP and in keeping with trying to integrate governance with other orders of government, um, such a commission would really need to have significant indigenous representation and um, ideally representation from the federal government and, and, and also from local governments involved in that. And uh, one of the tasks that this uh, coastal commission could do and could undertake as has been done, for example, in Washington state is it could periodically produce a state of the coast report. And so this would be um, a, a report that would look at the health of, of our oceans and of coastal communities. And it could be an opportunity to see if our coastal management is, um, is, is, is working in a way that's furthering the goals of our coastal strategy. And if not, then we know what we have to uh, what we need to change uh, as, as we go forward. And so um, that's one key tool that we've seen in coastal strategies around the world that we're, we're kind of sorely missing in British Columbia. Um, another area that a lot of people around the province are very much concerned about, and uh, when we talk to local governments, it's a, a very big concern for them as well, and, and also for indigenous nations is shoreline protections. And so um, there's a lot of problems on our shorelines right now that are, are causing people a lot of concerns. Um, some things are, for example, people are, are very much concerned about the impacts of climate change and as they get um, uh, more severe uh, sea level rise, increased storms and flooding, and are very much concerned that, that we are not prepared 
for those impacts uh, for our coastal communities and for our coastal ecosystems. Uh, another thing that we hear a lot from folks is about uh, shoreline development and the hardening of our shorelines. And so what I mean by, by hardening, I mean uh, the building of things like uh, sea, well, uh, sea walls and, and, and piers and things that interrupt the natural cycles of our shoreline ecosystems. Um, this is happening more and more along our coasts and is having significant impacts on, on shoreline ecosystems on things like forage fish beaches, which are really kind of integral to, um, to ocean ecosystems. Um, we're also seeing things like lots of plastic and styrofoam from docks and a lot of other problems on our shoreline. And um, this is something that has been kind of a core component of coastal strategies around the world is creating a shoreline protection act. And um, uh, Nova Scotia just did this. Uh, they adopted a shoreline protection act in 2019. And we, have, we also have great examples uh, to the south of us. For example, Washington has had a shoreline protection act um, since the 1970s. And um, we even have examples here in uh, British Columbia um, for our freshwater shorelines, where we have a riparian areas regulation that kind of uh, 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 creates protections and regulations about developments in freshwater shorelines. Um, but we don't have that kind of regime for our uh, saltwater shorelines. And so without that, we have a number of different local governments who have kind of created plans as best as they can, but they're not necessarily coordinated or well supported by the province. And so we can follow um, a model like, for example, Nova Scotia and Washington, where we could designate a uh, shoreline protection area and create a law to protect it. And then um, as is done in Washington state, you can have coordination between the governments involved on creating plans for those areas to ensure that A, we're ready for climate change impact and to protect uh, the natural shoreline ecosystems um, that are so important to us and to, and to nature. And um, the third tool and, and the last tool I'm gonna talk about uh, that is a key component of many coastal strategies and should be supported here in British Columbia is uh, marine plans. And uh, this is where I'm gonna talk about what I mentioned earlier, but um, in the north of our uh, province, um, there's a really exciting initiative going on right now that's been in place since 2015 called the Marine Planning Partnership for the North Pacific Coast. And what it is, is a partnership between the provincial government and indigenous nations. Um, and they've created marine spatial plans for four areas in, in Northern British Columbia. So for uh, Haida Gwaii, for the Northern coast, for the Central coast and for Northern Vancouver Island. And the plans go roughly down to um, around Campbell River um, on Vancouver Island. And so under these plans, they're, they're called marine spatial plans. Um, and so they're a bit like uh, zoning plans for a city in that under these plans, they will indicate areas where certain activities can happen, areas where activities shouldn't happen, and then areas where um, very important ecological areas that shouldn't be disturbed. Um, they've also set up monitoring programs uh, for these areas. So they're aware of, of the health their ecosystems and of their communities and, and how these plans are working. Um, however, um, there are some concerns um, with kind of the future of these plans and I'll just, I'll just name two, but in particular is um, these plans are not, uh, there isn't a law, a provincial law in place right now that requires that these plans be followed by provincial decision makers. Um, and, that, and that these plans are recognized in provincial law. Um, another concern is that um, there's no dedicated long-term funding from the province to make sure that these marine plans are going to be successful in the future and continue to be able to operate the programs that they're doing. And so those concerns obviously, you know, would come to the forefront if we had a government suddenly that was not interested in supporting these plans without a law and dedicated funding 
um, it would be easier to disregard these plans and, and all the great work that's been done under them. Um, the other concern, of course, is that these plans extend down to Campbell River, but we have areas down in the south that don't benefit from similar uh, marine plans. And again, we could use more support to make sure that we have plans in that area. And right now is actually a great time for the province to be interested in marine plans because um, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has uh, received a mandate and funding to start developing plans um, uh, in the southern part of British Columbia as well. And so under a coastal strategy, um, some of the things that we could do are um, have a, oh, sorry about that, uh, we could um, have a commission that supports the creation of these kinds of marine plans. We could dedicate long-term funding to make sure that these plans are successful and working. And we could have a law, as they do in Washington State, that requires that these uh, plans are, are followed and, and that decision makers abide by these plans. Um, okay, so I tried to just give you, um, I know that's a lot of information, and so I very much appreciate any questions at the end of this um, on any of this, but um, I'm trying to just give you kind of a high level idea of what this coastal strategy can accomplish and how it can change our ocean management, really with the goal that we have sustainable, healthy uh, ecosystems on our coast for generations to come. Um, I think coastal strategy is going to be a hugely important piece of that. Um, before I go, I just want to point out a couple other things um, that the marine program is has been working on or has done. And one of them is um, last year we put out um, a guide to coastal and ocean protection law in British Columbia, which is kind of a, a it's an exciting textbook um, about uh, ocean law in British Columbia, and it's really the only kind of record like this of its kind and, and of its scope. And it's something that, that we were very excited about at West Coast Environmental Law and been working on for a long time. And um, it's available um, on our website right now. Uh, you can find a link to it. And um, the exciting news for us is that we are currently working with uh, the University of British Columbia Press um, to have this guide uh, published by UBC Press as well. So we will have uh, physical copies of this guide um, in the near future um, as well. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I, I think I've been talking for a long time and I really, uh, I, I look forward to any questions that you might have um, uh, about uh, the coastal strategy or, or anything else marine related. Um, but yeah, thank you again for, uh, for taking the time today and, and thank you for supporting us. Um, uh, uh, we very, very much appreciate um, having that support and being able to do this important work.